Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sigil, but not Sigil 2, the first one. If you've never played it, what's fucking wrong with you? Play it, it's good. Uh, we're going to start a new game here. Uh, I was just testing out the recording software and also testing out the game to make sure it worked uh, with Beautiful Doom, which it seems to be working with. So we're going to go ahead and pick Ultra Vines. We're going to start a new game. Boom. So this starting area is not kind to the player. It's kind of a reminder or a, a portent of things to come. Harbinger of things to come, I should say. Um, all right, let's see if we can blow this guy away here. So I played this when it first came out. I was really excited when this uh, was announced. And um, I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, holy shit, the guy that I... The guy whose game I played when I was like, fi like five years old has made a new game. Like, holy shit. Um, and, uh, turns out, the hype was mostly justified for this. It's it's a very good Doom 1 um, wad, because it doesn't attempt to do what a lot of wads did with Doom 2, which is to sort of go absolutely ape shit with the engine. Uh, what this wad does that makes it good is it it plays to the limitations of the first game, which, and, and Limitations or, or, or constraints are what make art interesting, they're what makes reality interesting. Really, they're what makes anything interesting, is, is trying to adapt to constraints. If, if everything was okay all the time, and we were all free to do whatever we wanted at all times, um, it would be a very shitty reality. You know, that said, you can go too far with restrictions, uh, which, is, which is sort of the norm. Uh, and the reason I think it's the norm in human societies is that we know restriction has value, so we often take restriction to um, to, a, to an extreme that doesn't need to be taken to um, in terms of like social organization. But in terms of artistic expression, at least, um, that shit should be pretty open. Um, you really don't want to... Oh, damn, I forgot about this. Can we bypass this for a sec? I just want to see what's over here. Okay. We're going to leave this for a little later. Again, I played this wad when it came out, but I haven't played it since, so I'm, I'm kind of unfamiliar with it. So we're going to go ahead and re-navigate this. It's like we've been reborn, like we've, we've just cleansed ourselves, and now we're a new person. We've got a new clone body that we can use. But our mind is the same. Our consciousness remains the same. As it should, of course. Now, does this... Is that a button we can press? What the fuck is that? Okay, that's nothing. Romero was really crafty in this, um, in, in some ways more than Sigil 2, where he hid things in a way that wasn't familiar at the time. You know, now, you know, if you play Sigil 2 and then, you know, you played Sigil 1, you're like, oh yeah, I remember this or that or whatever. Um, like, you can see the, the eyeballs are a lot more obvious in this. Um, but, you know, that's how it should be. Like, like he was sort of experimenting with it. And the fact that he was able to adapt to fan-made changes to his game enough that the fans are satisfied with this difficulty is a testament to his familiarity and, and ingenuity with, with the, the medium. Um, because to come back after like decades of not developing a game like this and still be able to impress people who've been spending those decades doing experimental weird shit with your own game engine, that's fucking amazing, man. Like, like that's... Like, if Mario's, you know, source code had been open, like, if the, the Super Mario or, or Mario 64 code had been um, open, which I guess, you know, people have hacked it, but imagine if it had been released at the same time as the game, for anybody to do whatever they wanted with it, right? And despite that, the, the original developer was able to come back and be like, I'm going to do Mario 64 2, or whatever, and still impress the players. And I guess they did in a sense, with, with Mario Galaxy, but, um, I don't know, man. This this game is just great. Um, Romero is, uh, he's a talented motherfucker. Um, no other way to put it. He's a, he's a, he's a digital poet. He, he knows how to write, uh, he knows how to write poetry with code that creates visuals. Uh, which, if you're a writer or a poet or, or a, a mathematician or an architect, I mean, what you're really doing is you're trying to create 
fascinating, interesting, compelling, hypnotic things uh, using your medium. Uh, and they may have practical applications, but even if they do, even if their main purpose is to be practical things, um, their ancillary purpose that's equally important is to be amazing. Like, you have to enthrall and, and, uh, and amaze people um, in order to convince them to use something that, that is useful. Uh, because most people, if they're half, you know, half awake or half intelligent, are cognizant of the fact that most things are, are, are created to deceive them. Um, you know, the whole Plato's, ca Plato's Cave thing. Um, so if you want to uh, convince someone to actually be on board with something that you've made, what you really have to do is say, well, this is entertaining and practical at the same time. And um, that's really important. Um, it's not just an American or a capitalist uh, a mentality or ethos. Every, every culture on Earth has its, uh, its sort of propaganda. Um, and that propaganda exists for a good reason, because it, it, uh, it attempts to sort of fuse utility with um, flourish or performance or, or external surface level shit. Um, again, it's a necessary thing. It has to be done. Um, it's something that uh, that can't be avoided, really. Shit. Did I just fuck myself? Holy fuck, I'm an idiot. God damn it. Fuck, man. God damn, that's gonna set us back a few minutes. Well, anyway. I'm gonna do a bit of recording tonight because I'm, I'm feeling pretty charged up. So, whatever. Um... Right, fuck you, son. My god, they spawned us in Detroit. Jesus Christ, this mod is ruthless, man. This map spawned us in downtown Detroit. God damn. Not saying any mob represents any race of people, but god damn, this, this is like hell. That's what I'm saying. It's Detroit's like hell. That's the metaphor. That's the comparison I'm trying to make. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. Don't fuck you, man. Oh, fuck. Okay, so we're not gonna go grab the, uh, Superman face. We are instead gonna... Do this. We're gonna pop a cap in that eye. I was thinking about eyes earlier. Um, there's a lot of very weird, occult, esoteric, conspiracy kind of theories about um, about eyes. I want to make sure I use all the uh, approved uh, cognito hazard shield terms, um, like conspiracy theory. Uh, and really, what those are is they're just they're just terms that discourage people who are not cognitively uh, resilient enough to to process the information. Uh, people who get ex uh, obsessed about those things are equally vulnerable to them um, and shouldn't be um, forcefully exposed to them, but you know, there's different um, ethoses about how knowledge should be distributed and there's, there's a lot of knowledge that's very accessible, like it's not that it's not explainable or accessible to people. That's not the problem. The barrier is not that, you know, oh you have to know 9,000 scientific jargon terms to understand this concept. That's not the problem. The problem is the actual implications of knowing what the knowledge implies, if you have a basic understanding of anything, is so toxic and dangerous to your own brain that if you don't have a very weird type of brain, um, you're actually not meant to know it. Uh, in Brave New World, there's a whole class of human beings that's engineered um, specifically to endure the depressing, nihilism-inducing knowledge of how society has to be run for it to work. And 
Um, there's really no equivalent in 1984, which, which, as I've grown older, I've realized Brave New World is actually the more accurate and, and better uh, depiction of, of how society has been engineered to run and how it will be run. There, there's going to be artificial wars, but the, the 1984 side of things is really only for the complete idiots. And if AI continues to become more sophisticated, those types of NPCs, those types of half-conscious people will not be required to download themselves from uh, some higher dimension or from, from some other realm or from heaven or from hell or from wherever. Uh, they, won't, they won't need to be here. Um, they'll be replaced by, by simple algorithms that don't have a soul or a potential to have a soul. So the point is that 1984, which is geared towards those types of people, hypnotizes them and motivates them through warfare, um, which is a very primal, um, lizard brain kind of uh, basic way of motivating people, is to say, well, your, 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 uh, you know, your family or your, your, yourself are, are a threat, and the only way to, to respond to that is, to, is through violence. And there are times when that's true, regardless of the era, or regardless of the philosophy or the ethos that your society is built on. There are times when violence is necessary. Um, but the, the point is that 1984 portrays it as like a, like a necessary artificial thing. Like, the society will create artificial outlets for violence. That's going to go out of style. You can take my word on this. I'm from the future. I've been to different time periods. I'm not new at this. I haven't been to this one specifically, and this is a weird one, I gotta be honest. You guys are kind of... You're not fucked, but, but, but my god, you're... You know, you're, you're, you're jumping into different acid baths one after another. Like, this is, this is some crazy shit. This is a crazy time. Um, by any measure. From any standpoint. Anyway. Brave New World is a more viable strategy for a long-term society because it um, it accepts genetic modification. It does a whole bunch of other um, radical things that uh, allow it to practice eugenics in a sort of roundabout, subtle, uh, not half-assed, but um, what's the term I'm looking for? Convoluted way. Um, it, it, it lets... Uh, it lets uh, the planning of um, future generations be be subtly designed without anybody's any vampire lord's thralls being too informed about it. And uh, again, these are all vampire systems. Um, you know, this 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 Earth, if you believe certain very specific conspiracy theories, which I don't believe, and I'm not being ironic. I, I don't believe them. I, I can't believe them. If, if I did, it would drive me nuts, so I, I refuse to allow myself to believe these things. But I do entertain them intellectually. I use the shield of science and intellect and language in order to be able to think about these things without being emotionally attached to them. That's the real occult secret. They won't tell you that. But anyway, I, 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 I like these theories because they, they express some metaphoric interpretations of reality that explain the behavior of um, various types of people. And, uh, you know, some people are like these flaming heads. They just want to wait in the corner and then attack you. And then they kill you. <laughs> um, but, uh, for real though, um, vampiric people will exist in any system because whatever vampirism is, whether it's an alien virus or a genetic predisposition, or an actual disease, or a fungal infection, or, or, or something else, whatever it is, um, it seems to be something that benefits human beings in certain contexts and situations, and we don't want it to go extinct. There's a certain sort of shared memory of vampirism's utility, and um, there's a great D&D &D book, by the way, um, it's called The Fossil... It's, it's an excerpt from a D&D a &D book. It's called The Fossil Vampire, which is a very risky thing. I feel like the person who wrote that may have, may have had an unfortunate accident. Um, the, the fact that that, that got published, that that got printed, is, is surprising to me. 
So if you look up um, D&D Fossil Vampire, you'll find some interesting things. Um, it suffices to say that, that that tendency towards sort of this parasitic um, feeding, feeding off of other people kind of mentality. Um, there are times in history where the entire genetic archive of humanity was forced to do that in order to survive. And morally speaking, it's difficult to make a judgment because we didn't experience that. We have no memory of it. If you were tasked with preserving all of humanity by lowering yourself to something inhuman, ironically, to preserve what was human, you know, would you be able to do it? I don't know if I would. I don't know. But if that had to be done in the past, it means that the people who did that survived. And it means that their willingness to abdicate morality was in some way instantiated or preserved in our genes. So we have genetic parameters or um, we have genetic imperatives that, that express that need, uh, that potential need. And certain conditions of, of stress may or may not activate those genes in different people. So if the economy is bad, if, if war is, is breaking out, if, if, things are, if things are very tight, things are very stressful, very strained, human beings might involuntarily express those vampiric genes and try to feed off of each other in order to preserve some greater uh, percentage of humanity. It's a chilling thing. It's a it's a conspiratorial thing. It, there, there's there's not um, really any sort of uh, scientific basis that I can that I can call forth to legitimize what I'm saying. Um, again, this is just bullshit ranting. You know, I'm, I'm playing a fucking Doom mod. Like, you know, if you're going if you're coming here for philosophy or, or anything anything similar to it, you're you're coming to the wrong place. Also, I'm gonna get fucking killed. This 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 end screen sort of area is, is a nightmare. Oh, shit! Did we preserve the Mansphere? We did. Ah, yes. We were smart enough to do that. Very good. Okay. Let's kill this guy. Let's go grab that sphere. But, uh, anyway. Um, metaphor metaphorical theories um about history are interesting to me because history is it's so replete with um, edits from powerful people that are difficult to um, dismiss the relevance of like a powerful person can change history based on who they have in their power who is archiving events and again this sounds probably rudimentary to a lot of you, but but the, the point is that the people who are archiving history are more important than the real events. Because even if they're chronicling a real event, they could exaggerate it, they could diminish it, or they could obfuscate it to the point of being completely deleted. I mean, they, they could pretend it didn't exist. Um, this is a reality of human... Um, historicism of archiving information as the beings we are, as these protein-based things. So, it's something to keep in mind. I'm gonna try to reload that in the fucking shot. This is a this is a dick move to, to subject the player to this. Okay, one shotgun shot, I can handle that. Jesus, I fell down the elevator shaft again. God damn. Whoa! Excuse me, Mr. Demon Face. Get that elevator back here. I'm gonna fucking kill you. Okay, anyway. Um, we didn't get all the secrets, guys. There's a bunch that I, I probably missed, but um, I'm not gonna try too hard for this series. I, I just want to do this for fun. I want to revisit this uh, epic Satan. Oh my god! He's so evil and cool. Don't you want to be a devotee? 
It's not like none of the Babylonian gods are good or evil and that nothing matters, that they're all benefactors of different things and everybody demands an equal price from you, including Christ. It's not like that's true. You should really just avoid every religion, to be honest. I guess if I'm being unironic, just, just, just I, do one of two things. Here are my recommendations for spirituality. Do what you would do in Skyrim. Cringy as it sounds, offer yourself to every single deity that asks for your soul. And then fuck over all of them. Drake all of them. Equally. Don't don't give give yourself to anybody. Or offer yourself to no one. Which is the much harder path, but those are the only two ways you're gonna keep your soul. You offer yourself to everybody to the point where if one of them asks for payment, and if you're in a position where you think you might have to pay them, some other one will come along and go, no, his soul's mine. And all of a sudden, you've got demons competing for your soul amongst themselves. Because they're stupid. They're retards. Demons are retards. They're powerful retards, so you gotta be careful. But they are retards. And so is God, a.k.a. the Demiurge. Sophia is the only one that uh, you can't fuck over. If you try to, she'll... She'll prove she can't be fucked over. Anyway, guys, let's go ahead and pass through the veil here. Boo! And, you know what? Sheol, we're going to end the video there. Thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And uh, do check out these two wads, Sigil 1 and 2. They're both very good. Um, hope your holiday's going well. Um, I'm going up to visit some family. I'm a little nervous, but I'm looking forward to seeing them. And that's what keeps me feeling positive. So I hope the same thing's true of you. Hope no matter, no matter what's going on in your life, if, if you're not feeling great about yourself or what you're doing, take comfort in the fact that your family just wants to know that you're still here. I mean, um, you know, they're not out to interrogate you or, or judge you or anything. They, they just, they just want to know you're doing okay and, and they want to check out what you've been doing. They're curious and, and they're supportive. They're not judgmental or interrogative. They're curious and supportive. So... Keep that in mind, and uh, keep yourself healthy, um, take breaks, have a drink now and then, you know, let loose every now and then, you got to do that, and, uh, you know, peace, peace out. <laughs>